thank you for coming out this, uh, this afternoon. What a beautiful day. Even if it's a little chilly for September. It is still September. I'm Dr. Pamela trotman reed president of the University of St. Joseph. And we're really delighted to be in partnership with the Amistad Museum for this uh, program this evening. And, you know, I just want to take uh, two seconds, well, maybe three, to say we're delighted to have you on our campus. This is an amazing university and institution. We've always been part of Connecticut. And, and sometimes, even though we've been here for more than 80 years, some people don't fully appreciate how many uh, people that probably uh, are in your neighborhood, teachers, social workers, nurses, nutritionists, uh, far, soon to be pharmacists, but also business women, and men too. Our graduate programs are co-ed, even though we're still all women and producing women leaders at the undergraduate level. We still have co-ed programs in evening and weekends for adults in a myriad of opportunities. And you know, presidents only talk about US News and World Report and we can massage it in our favor. So, um, <laughs> so if you look, so I have to go through several categories. If you look at regional universities in the North, we're fourth in Connecticut. So we're growing, we're growing, thank you. But, but I think that our students are first in many areas where people, superintendents of schools, heads of hospitals, corporate workers say that they hire St. Joseph students first uh, because of our values, because of our preparation. And, and I hope that this is, if this is the first time you're visiting our campus, you'll come back many more times and find out the quality of the students and the activities that go on here. So this one is just uh, one of many. But it's really our pleasure, and so let me introduce the director of the Amistad Museum, uh, Olivia. I'm down here. Oh, I'm down here. <laughs> oh, there you are. Okay. So I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thanks again for coming. And thank you to Amanda Boyd, who's in the front here, who's also with um, Connecticut Humanities. And I just want to take one second to do a PSA for the Amistad Center for Art and Culture. Um, we are a museum within a museum. We're housed at the Wadsworth Athenaeum in downtown Hartford. Um, we are not the ship. 
So here we go. Um, I have read both of Atticus' books, and so I think we're going to talk about both of Atticus' books a little bit. But for those of you who have not yet met her and don't know anything, I want to start by asking you to tell us a little bit about where you're from and sort of who your peoples are. <laughs> and frankly, if I had five dollars every time somebody said to me, great book, where did your name come from? Yes. I could probably retire. I'm almost <laughs> old enough to retire, but I'm not financially stable enough to retire. So, um, so enlighten folks. I was born in 1974, 
three years after the uprising at Attica Prison in upstate New York. Uh, and I was named after the uprising at Attica Prison in upstate New York. And for you very young people in the audience, that was like a major moment in American history. It was this huge turning point for uh, prison reform and prison rights, but it was a revolt where more than 200 people ended up killed. Uh, at the end, so people remembered it. You know why I realize it's gotten swallowed up over the years? It's because it happened right around the time of September 11. Its date was like, I think the, the, uh, the uprising was like, like nine, the September 9th through the 13th. Mm -hmm. And my whole life, it was always recognized every September until September 11th happened. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's why a lot of people don't know about it. But I'm, I'm, so I'm born and raised in Houston, Texas, and I'm um, a child of, of two activists. Um, and, um, I guess that kind of is the lens that I kind of came into the world with. Um, I think in my work a lot, there is a lot of sociopolitical themes. Mm -hmm. Social justice is a big Social threat. justice is a big um, threat for me. It's a really big threat. And I think what's, um, when I was growing up, you know, having had these parents who were in court, marching in the streets, do you know? All you know, my dad almost went to trial. I uh, went to jail, excuse me, prison for inciting a riot in 1970. And I grew up with all the imagery of him on the courthouse steps and um, and all their marches and, and organizing. I always felt kind of like small in comparison to what they had done at my age. Um, you know, when I was in college, I remember thinking of what they were doing when they were in college versus what I was doing when I was in college, which was not marching anywhere but to a keg. I mean, I wasn't doing anything. Um, so it's, it's nice in life to have found my way to carry on their legacy. Mm -hmm. We're in a different time. Um, I don't know that I could repeat their deeds, but, but it, they landed with me, and, and they are definitely a big part of my, part of my work. You grew up in Houston, and Houston is the setting for your first book, Blackwater Rising. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. What, what made you want to write about sort of the oil business and city corruption? And then? Well, I don't think I knew that I was doing that. I, I, the Blackwater Rising is an infinitely better book than the one I set out to write. I, I thought I was just going to write a really slick thriller. And the opening of Blackwater Rising is an incident that actually happened in my family's life, which is uh, Blackwater Rising follows this young attorney, he's like 31, who uh, a black guy who was involved in the civil rights movement, and now finds himself in 1981 Houston, Texas, at the dawn of the Reagan era, trying to kind of psychologically navigate this big cultural shift in the country. And the opening chapter is he has no money, he's a small attorney with a practice in a strip mall, he gets some, a client who knows somebody who knows somebody to get him a free boat ride on Buffalo Bayou in Houston, Texas. My dad was a small time criminal defense attorney who had no money, who knew somebody who knew somebody who got this boat ride um, on Buffalo Bayou. It sounds- and The boat ride was, a, was an anniversary present. It was an anniversary wife. present for my stepmom. And we, so when you get on, it's a bayou, so there's no, there's no getting around, it's a bayou. But when you, get, when you dock on it in downtown Houston, the bayou runs kind of almost below uh, uh, street level. So the streets up there and the tall buildings and the light, it's kind of it's picturesque. But the, the bayou then snakes through the backside of some pretty bad neighborhoods. And we got out there and we got on the backside of Fifth Ward and we heard a woman screaming for help. And then we heard a gunshot. And Everything kind of stopped on the boat, and there was a, an immediate debate about what were we supposed to do with what we just heard. And what struck me was the reaction between my father and his best friend. My father, both in the movement, both co-defendants in that trial in 1970. My dad went on to become a criminal defense attorney, and his best friend went on to become a minister who officiated my wedding some many, many years later. I was about 11 at the time, and I was struck by the moral fight going on and where these two men from the movement and their aging had landed. Because the minister said, we have a moral obligation to stop this boat and do whatever we can to help this woman. My dad said, no, my child is on board, my wife is here, and you don't know what that is that you would be stopping the boat for. He was a pragmatist. He was a pragmatist. Mm -hmm. And so I just struck. And so I started Blackwater Rising just thinking about that incident. And the more I started writing, the more I realized I was actually 
trying to say something bigger than that. Mm -hmm. um, I had to write a scene where Jay Porter, who gets involved in a long shoreman's strike, who reluctantly gets involved because people know he used to be this great activist. And now that there's a problem going on with the union uh, integrating between the black union and the white union, they want him to get in there and negotiate and get involved. And he doesn't want to have anything to do with any of it. His movement days are over. And he had to, I had to write a scene where he goes to go talk to the mayor of Houston. And in my book, they had this previous relationship when they were both on campus together. She was kind of like a closet radical that nobody knows about now that she's this pre-internet, now that she's you know, running a city. But I couldn't write that scene in the present unless I wrote their past. Mm -hmm. And so I remember thinking, well, I'm just going to do this as a lark. Let me just kind of write a scene with the two of them in like 68. And then when I was writing it, I was like, oh, no, I actually think this might be part of the book. I mean, I actually think this belongs in the book. And I remember feeling very terrified that I had veered off into, so how am I into the movement? And I thought I was just writing this Grisham you know, thriller. How did I get here? Uh, but I just, I just went with it. How often does something that happens in real life end up in your books? Well, I mean, I'm on, I'm on three now, so it's not a ton of them, but every one of them. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> there's, a, there's something that I can't get out of my head. Um, with the first book, it was this crazy incident on a boat and a woman screaming. With the cutting season, I went to a wedding at one of these um, historical tourism plantations, and I couldn't get that out of my head. Um, the third book right now um, is all about an election, and my dad ran for mayor of Houston in 2009, and it was one of the worst experiences, most painful experiences of my life, and I was not prepared for that. I just thought, I didn't know when I saw the sausage king. I mean, I thought I had cynicism. I thought I had a healthy dose of cynicism. But it's infinitely more awful than anything I imagined. And the smaller the election, the dirtier and pettier it is. Um, and so, yeah, in each book, there's some kind of inciting thing. Um, although I'm thinking about a fourth book now that actually has nothing to do with anything that's ever happening, never. That could happen in the meanwhile. Anyway. Yeah, that, that's true. <laughs> that's something to shift. In, um, in the cutting season, which does take place on one of these grand Louisiana plantations with the big alley of live oaks that interlock over the, you know, over the, the walkway or the driveway that goes up. I mean, it's really, it was more Tara than Tara. So yeah. when, when I was reading, I thought, well, I've seen some of these places, you know, going past the signs for them when you drive down yes. the 10 through Gulfport and Biloxi yes. and uh, that way. And it, there was clearly a way of life that some people still very much cherish. But like you, it kind of, gave me a little frisson, just the creeps, like, yeah, boom, you know. Yeah, yeah. Could have been me in there who was like stirring yes. pots in the kitchen yes. or, you know, wringing chicken's necks or whatever, because you, you very much get the sense of history of this place, not, not just the glory, but sort of the blood, other yes. people's blood that went into making these places what they well, are. Well, that's what you and I get out. I think some other people go there and feel if we are stepping into the labor of that, other people are stepping into the fantasy of not laboring and not being at their nine to five job and whatever. And it's a fantasy of you were going to sit on the veranda and you have somebody like me bring yeah, you <laughs> exactly. and have somebody else fanning you and bringing you stuff. I mean, I, yeah. think, I think there are people for her. I mean, Paula Dean, mm -hmm. you know, her whole fantasy of having a wedding where black people were dressed up like slaves. I mean, to her, it was stepping into fantasy of a, of a different time, which we, a fantasy that I cannot per participate in. I mean, it's not for yeah. me. Yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not a fantasy for me. Yet, I, I have to say, I'm just going to say this. I actually found our conversation around the Paula Dean thing to be very problematic in the sense that the N-word, her finding out old ass Paula Dean said the N-word is not, come on, y'all. That's not really that big of a deal. I was much more disturbed that in 2013, you wanted to host a wedding where people dressed up like slaves. That's the problem. I mean, that's really, and it also speaks to the way she also retreated. There's a bigger story about Paula Dean that's about class and workers' yes. rights yes. than not the N-word. We get so fixed. And I'm not saying that she ever needed to say it or whatever, but the way that she treated her workers in the restaurant, mm -hmm. these fantasy weddings she wanted to have where she's resting on other people's labor, that's what's wrong with her. That's really what's wrong with her. Well, and then there's the menu itself. <laughs> when, when all of this was sort of at its height, one of my editors said, 
his mother called him and he, she said, he said, I can't talk to you right now. I'm doing, I'm reporting on this Paula Dean thing. And his mother kind of snorted and said, I don't even know why they're all upset about that N-word business. She done killed more black people with that bad cooking, right. that lard filled cooking than anybody. Don't hurt my feelings. I don't care. Just don't give me that stuff to eat. And he hung up the phone and he said, you know, my mother is a very wise woman. <laughs> she would spank you more, but yeah, she's a very wise it's woman. True. It's true. It's true. Anyway. So you have so your your protagonist in the cutting season is someone uh, good name by the way. You yeah. spell it wrong. Karen Karen Gray, who who grew up on yes. a plantation literally, who has wanted to get away from it for yes. a long time, got away from it, and through a series of circumstances returns to the plantation and ends up working there yes. and is ambivalent about being there even as an adult. Yes, I came to Karen Gray because, I mentioned this in the class that I was um, talking to today, so when I decided, I, okay, this whole thing started because I went to a wedding at one of these places at Oak Alley Plantation in Vacherie, Louisiana, and it was a, a white guy marrying a black woman. I'm in an interracial marriage. And I just couldn't understand why anybody would choose to start your marriage on such grounds of inequality. So I just was stunned, stunned, stunned by this crazy, I and mean, also there were women dressed as, they were not black, thank God, but dressed as mammies, kid you not, handing out pralines as we walked in. It's, this place is bizarre. It's got a bed and breakfast and a restaurant and an ice cream shop. They bottle and sell their own mint syrup and they're just selling this strange historical kitsch. And so when I knew I wanted to write about this place, I started doing all this research about um, sugarcane plantations in Louisiana, from the architecture to the economics of it to the relationships between the slave mistress and the slaves, all this. And I found this one book of letters that a plantation mistress was writing home to her mother in like Maryland. And the letters were pre through the Civil War and post the Civil War. And when I read that book in 2009, I actually realized that I had more in common with the slave mistress in 2009 than I did with the slaves. Really? Why? Because I was no longer a part of a labor class. Mm -hmm. That I, I am the great granddaughter of a maid. Mm -hmm. When I was growing up, we had a woman from El Salvador in our house cooking and cleaning so that my mothers could have her um, uh, economic ascent. Mm -hmm. My mother could not run her company unless this woman left her kids and came to our house to work so that my mom could do her thing. And now I was doing it again in 2009. Mm -hmm. that, that my ability to write full time or, or, or have a professional career was on the back of other women coming into my home to help me raise my kid and help me run a household. And because of you know the time and place that I live, these are women from Latin America. These are women who we do not have anything culturally in common. We don't always speak the same language. I didn't know if they liked me very much. I didn't know if they were suspicious of me. I didn't like when they called me a missus. I couldn't stand, I mean, that literally would make my skin crawl. And so, so Mrs. Attica? One woman, I think she's couldn't say Attica, but she kept calling me missus. And mm -hmm. it, it just, for me, it's loaded. Every time she walked in the door, a bunch of American history came in on a breeze behind her. Mm -hmm. And I could never write in the house. It drove me crazy. Mm -hmm. It just wasn't for me because I couldn't divorce it from a lot of, um, history. I, I just couldn't divorce it from that. So that's where Karen came from, the irony that here's a woman whose ancestors cut sugar cane, then they were sharecroppers, then her mother was a cook on the plantation when a family bought it and, and owned it and lived there just as a family. And Karen tried to get away from it and now after Katrina and having no place to be, ends up back there running it as a general manager with an office in the big house and can look out on those fields. And I think the ambivalence to me was about well, I'm ambivalent about, you know, I have mixed up feelings about slavery, period. But also I think for her, the idea that you have arrived in the big house, I think that, that economic ascent for black people and for women is complicated in that we don't have a fantasy that we kind of did it all by ourselves, and it's not as enjoyable if other people aren't coming up with us. So I think that Karen's ambivalence about her arriving, so to speak, is mixed up with the fact that now in the sugarcane fields, you got a bunch of people from Guatemala and Mexico yeah. cutting the sugarcane. So is that really progress? Is that the, is, is the American dream you now stepping on somebody else and that's what it means to have arrived in America? Or might the whole system need to be re-looked at in some kind of way? So that's where, that's where Karen came from for me. 
And it's very interesting because you, you explored the class differential within the black community because right. here's a university educated young black woman, woman who comes back who is hired by the white, white plantation yep. owners who've been there ancestrally for a couple hundred years to sort of modernize the way the whole plantation factory thing is run. And the people she's supervising are people who, who are her mother's contemporaries. Her mother has died. And so she's supervising people who are old enough to be her mother and who know more about yeah. running the yeah. kitchen than she does. And are suspicious of her. And have made it very clear that, look, honey, you know, you could drop back here with your little university degree and your little modernization or the whatever. I still cook the greens in this kitchen. And so she's got a very tricky path to negotiate between being the boss, but also being respectful to these people who are elders, mm -hmm. who have institutional knowledge that she doesn't have, and who were there when she was there also seems to be right. a big right. cloud of right. guilt hanging About over her, her for having left the plantation in the first place. You know, this is your home, this is where you were needed, yet you weren't there. Mm -hmm. And you got some making up to do. Yeah. And, and she also has struggles with some of the younger staff members too, mm -hmm. that she doesn't really, and I think I, I was just interested in kind of shining the light on the reality of intraracial class stuff. Mm -hmm. And, um, and the peculiarness of feeling that I don't have, I personally, Attica, do not have that much in common with a 19-year-old black kid guy in Compton. There's gender, you know, class, uh, age, all kind of stuff that puts a gulf there, and yet there's still this familial thing that is that means we are connected. And I still feel that at the same time as the disconnect, and it sometimes has made me uncomfortable that that trying to navigate feeling like your family, but I don't really have anything in common with you at all. Your cousin, I'm fine with just seeing you once every three years at the reunion, that's okay. Right, right. Um, would you read a little bit from your book about Karen coming back home? I think you have a passage in there where she's trying to grapple with I what do. this means for her life. And this is, this is uh, emblematic of how I came to feel about these historical plantations. Because when I first showed up at this wedding, um, I felt a kind of anger um, about being in something so beautiful and knowing what it represented. And, and the arc of over the time of writing this book came to make a lot of peace um, with stuff that I had been ashamed of. So Karen basically gets displaced during Katrina. She's been living in New Orleans. And she and her daughter are actually holed up in a hotel in Beaumont, Texas, um, trying to figure out what in the world they're going to do now. Um, so in this hotel, they stayed a few more nights, just the two of them, until Karen was finally ready to go home, the only one she had left. What they had, they packed into the car, heading out early, early in the morning, heading for Ascension Parish and Bellevue. She had steeled herself for the reunion. She prepared herself to hate the place on sight, pointedly refusing to be courted by a pretty picture or its pretense of antebellum grace. And she made herself a single promise. She would not forget her family's generations of sweat here how trapped she felt by that very legacy growing up in the shade of these trees. Her original contract was for one year. The job paid well and provided a roof over their heads. The plan was to sit out for a few months, to stow away in a familiar place until she could figure out what she wanted to do next, what she wanted for her life and for her daughter. It was only supposed to be for one year. But the place got a hold of her from that first day, the first hour even, and it surprised her as much as it confused her to discover that she did not, after all these years, hate the plantation at all. That she could not hate what was now, and maybe always had been, her real home, the way she came into this world. Um, and that is the experience that I had. I had a lot of shame around, and I wouldn't say it's a conscious shame, I'm not saying I was going through my life being ashamed of slavery. But I avoided, um, I never would have on a Saturday decided, let's pull off the road and tour a plantation. I've always been like, you know, I saw roots, done. I'm done, <laughs> I don't really need to do, you know, and there's a, you know, I'm, I'm like a Jewish person who won't drive a German car. I don't want to see columns on my house, I don't want any of the iconography, I hate all of it. And so I would never have 
gone to a place like that. And then this wedding happens that forced me to be at it, and I was uncomfortable at a wedding that did not acknowledge where we were. Mm -hmm. I kept waiting all night for someone to make a toast or to make a speech or to say something about why we were here tonight. To, Besides you know, the wedding. I mean, no, but maybe we had all gathered to have a wedding here. Maybe this place was chosen so that we could come to this troubled ground and make peace with it, with love, or something to say why. But these people had just picked it as a pretty background. So when I went back to, yeah, they had just picked it because it was beautiful. So when I went back to Oak Alley in 2009, Barack Obama was in the White House. I went back to this plantation. Um, I went by myself because by then I had Karen in my mind and I knew she lived in my, on my fictitious plantation by herself. So I said, you gotta kinda Attica go there by yourself. And I stayed in one of their little cottages and they had a, um, a screened in porch that I sat on with my little sad dinner from the Piggly Wiggly because I couldn't find a restaurant when I was driving in. I literally had a hunk of cheese, an apple, and a bottle of red wine. And I sat out on that porch and I listened to the cane leaves. And I made a point to say, to whoever was out there in spirit, thank you. And that I want you to know that your labor was not in vain. Um, it was profoundly moving for me to sit on the grounds of a plantation knowing that Barack Obama was in the White House. It just blew my mind. And I felt very much like what I wrote here that I can't, I no longer choose to be ashamed of the way I kind of came to America. That it, it I'm, I'm I don't want to hide from it. I want to sell, you know, I'm not talking about celebrating slavery. I'm talking about celebrating labor and perseverance and survivorship. And, um, and then and celebrating a country that can not do it fast enough, but can, if you can make the leap in a, in a nation's lifetime, then there's a lot of other stuff we can do better too. So it was, it was, it, it ultimately turned out to be a life changing kind of experience for me having gone to this crazy plantation. One of the things I thought was interesting in this book is that, you know, you always hear about how the South is different, is different, is more progressive than a lot of places in the North are now. Wait, who says that? Um, <laughs> various chambers of commerce <laughs> for places. Oh, they're trying to sell that in the South. They're yeah, trying to sell the New South. South. That's what they're trying um, to sell. And in this part of Louisiana, they weren't so much planning on a new set. They could say that things aren't the way they were 50 years ago, but it didn't feel to me like they were believing so much in the new South, because they were living in the old South while the new South was slowly creeping up to it, that this, this land was being bought up by developers. They wanted to turn and it into the, the, you know, condominiums and luxury whatever. Right, right. The new South is a catchphrase to get Toyota factories, to get major corporations to come there. That, that's all that stuff is, this idea. And I'm not saying, you know, people are not getting lunch every week like, like before, but, but that, is a, that is literally a, a moniker that I've heard cities use, and I know it's about attracting corporate business to their towns that, don't, that want to be in a place that feels sophisticated and not, you know, um, the Selma of yesteryear, the Charlotte of yesteryear. And I think it is a marketing technique, frankly, because I think you don't have to scratch that hard to get to the old South, it's like, right, underneath all that. Yeah, Faulkner said so. Um, your guys, though, your, your plantation owners, mm -hmm. um, have a very genteel facade. <laughs> they stay genteel for a fairly long time until they're pushed beyond what they think their endurance ought to be. You know, it's like, I've let you do this, I've let you do that, but there's still this sense of entitlement that is very present in how they deal with the staff, and to yes. a certain degree, how they deal with Karen. She's in the DMZ because they've handpicked her to come run this place on the one hand. She is university educated. She's the daughter of a beloved uh, member of the plantation <laughs> family. <laughs> uh, on the other hand, they're not too reluctant to point out, you have your job on our sufferance. Yes. You, your mother had her job on our sufferance, and basically, Bell B is still ours. Yeah. Even if all even if we sell the outlands and we do all the yeah. rest of it, yeah. this is still our place. Um, have some respect. And I th I think and I don't think that the main guy, Raymond Clancy, is even that conscious of it. And I think it's that kind of casual privilege mm -hmm. that is really 
tough to dislodge um, when it's unconscious, when it's, um, I mean, I think he actually sees himself as a benevolent, you know, leader, yeah. patriarch, whatever, who's kind to everybody, you know, remembers people's kids' names, but there, there is this kind of um, casual white privilege. Um, and also, I mean, I do, where I do feel, a, a, I don't know if compact compassion might be going too far, but I do understand the part of Raymond that feels like I want to slough off this legacy too, mm -hmm. that somehow I, if you're walking around with the le legacy of being oppressed, I'm walking around with the legacy of being the oppressor, and neither of them speak perfectly to the world we're in right now, so I, I'm uncomfortable in my role in it too. I mean, I do see that, that part of him, of why should I be blamed for something that my, without, but what he doesn't do is question the fact that he's still benefiting from his ancestors. Mm -hmm. So you can say, I don't want to be held responsible for what my ancestors did, but I do still want this house. <laughs> and I do still want, still want the know, trust I want all that I still other want kind of my stuff. Position I, in the I want all that. I still want to be able to have people do what I want them to yes, do. Yes. Because <laughs> they're sort of afraid of me, you know, in some yeah, ways. Yeah, definitely. So that's still there. Um, I was going to ask you something and it flew out of my head. It's hard getting old, I don't recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> she is in some ways almost an honorary white person. I mean, she's kind of seen Go that on, way. interesting, um, go on. Yeah, I mean, she's I've clearly, heard that because I give people honorary black status, but I never heard honorary. Well, you know, in, in South Africa for a, lot, for a long time, if they wanted you to come in, but you, they, didn't, they didn't want like the same privileges to afford it to everybody. Right. They'd make you honorary white for while you were there, and so you could do whatever it was that you needed to do. And some people accepted that, and some people said, "No, I'm with them over here, and if they can't, then I'm not going yeah, to." Yeah, yeah. Uh, but she's an honorary white person in the sense that she has a better education than the sons of the plantation owner. Yeah. Um, she doesn't. She doesn't. You know, some people say, "You know, I was talking to you, and I forgot you were black." I right. think in some ways they forget that she's black. Because I've had readers say that to me, which I find fascinating. I just always said, what are you talking? I mean, like, it's described right away that she's black. But then I get into questions. I'm sorry, I don't want to talk with you. No, no, go ahead. Well, you know, one woman, a black woman said to me that she wasn't sure that she was black. And that also because, and then she brought up her daughter's name. Mm -hmm. That because her daughter's name is Morgan, that that made her compute. So then I was like, what stereotypes are you walking around? And you are black. I mean, should the daughter have been named Shanisha? I'm mean, like, what are you talking about? Yes, I didn't know what she was. of black Morgans. Yeah, my cousin, I was like, my cousin's name is Morgan. What are you yeah. talking about? But, but she had a preconceived idea about how, I guess, Karen should talk or that she should get along with the staff mm -hmm. if she's black. But that was kind of the point I was trying to make is that there is this kind of isolation around her being middle management. Right. Being she's not the plantation owner. She's not right. the cook and the serving people and everything else. She's in this funny little bubble. Which I think black people are. I and mean, I think that's also its own metaphor for where middle class black America is. And we have a, we're not quite, you know, running everything, but at the same time, a new class of people are out in the fields. And we're kind of in the course of our history in this middle kind of path in a way. Mm -hmm. um, Talk about that new class of people because, I mean, in this book, you do talk a lot about sort of Brown being the new black, you know, where the cane cutters used to be black people in Louisiana. Mm -hmm. They now tend to come, those people have left, they found other jobs that either pay better or the working conditions are better or they've been able to go elsewhere mm -hmm. and they have been replaced because the work demands replacement mm -hmm. by people who are now brown who often don't speak the language, who are often here without papers, mm -hmm. um, who are putting up with many of the same working conditions that the black people before them are putting up with, and in some cases, even worse, because if you have no papers, then that's really something that I mean, you in know. a strange way, being owned mm -hmm. actually protect, it was more of a, a, a reason to protect your health and life being owned than if you're a throwaway person that just we can just get another one in yeah, in a minute yeah. or come don't worry about it um yeah i'm like i said you know the the in the shadow of everything and in fact the book is dedicated to two people um odell 
who is my grandmother, born in 1911, um, is gone. And Odilia, and Odilia was a woman from El Salvador that was in my house with me from the time I was nine mm -hmm. until I graduated high school. Odilia left her family in El Salvador because it was the, still fallout from the Civil War. Sure. And um, so I grew up with this idea of, and I didn't, I didn't understand it at nine, but the older I got, the more I could understand the, sac like, the sacrifice that this woman was making to have work in my house to allow me to have this Cosby existence. It was all, um, that was always in my head, like holding that juxtaposition. And so when I went back to O'Galley in 2009 and said, I'm gonna stay on the plantation, I'm gonna, I also went um, to the American Sugar Cane League. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Herman Wax back there was gonna show me around a bunch of sugar cane plantations, he was gonna show me a mill, the whole thing. Um, his fiance found out I was five, and she just showed up and rode in the middle seat in the pickup truck. <laughs> and I was like, "Lady, I you am." Kept her shoes. I know. I am <laughs> so not making a move on Herman Waggis back, but okay. But the three of us just rode around in Louisiana. Um, the three of us in the cab of the pickup truck, and I was stunned by the fact that of the irony that you know that now the people in the fields are all migrant workers, mm -hmm. and also that Oak Alley itself this place where you're coming to learn about slavery and learn about um, people's labor holding up uh, an institution, all the gardeners and everybody on the place are Mexican. And I was like, yeah, what's, is, what's the takeaway? What is, is this is so bizarre to me. I just found it really, really fascinating. And um, I have been thinking that maybe what I'm trying to do on this planet <laughs> this is a big, large statement, but I think I might have figured out what I'm trying to do. Um, and I, I need to read more about it, but I, I have learned a little bit about systems theory and about first order change and second order change. And I think I'm born into a period of second order change. It's a deeper level change. That first order would be, you know, first of all, getting rid of slavery. Uh, that you can vote, that you can eat anywhere, that you can, no more deed restrictions, you can live anywhere. Um, but then that can then just move black people into, a few of us into positions of power that can look like change, but that isn't a fundamental systemic change. So that if you still have um, people who are holding up an economy who are not able to participate as full citizens, there's still a deeper level of change that needs to happen. Um, and so I think because by virtue of the fact that I was born at a time where I'm the first person in my family to live a fully integrated existence. Everybody else started off life, in fact, all the way to college. And in fact, my dad integrated his college. So I'm the first one to be living theoretically King's dream. And so I'm interested in uh, now what? Now what do we do now? Well, now what? You know, is it enough for Barack Obama to be in a debate in the class today about is it enough for Barack Obama to be in the white, just the fact that he's in it. Can we just say, oh, he did it, y'all, <laughs> and be kind of done? Or is there a deeper level of, of work to, to be done? And I argue that, that there is. Well, in fact, some of the response you get sometimes is, shut up, you got a black president in the White House, what else do you want? Really, <laughs> you people, so grabby. <laughs> so grabby, well, they got, they, they know the, the people on the right think that he's giving out cell phones and, <laughs> I didn't get one. I had to pay for mine myself. I'm good thing he's not running again because I'd have words for him. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about how you write. You know, every writer has a different way of doing it. Um, Walter Mosley once told me, I write every day, rain or shine. I get up in the morning, I don't even brush my teeth, I just sit my butt in the chair and I do it for you know a couple of hours. And that's why you have to get your subconscious rolling again in order to have your characters come out. I have other people who say, I write you know, from nine to 12 every day and then I go out and do something else with my brain because yeah, you get stale. Right. And there are all kinds of people in between. So what's the Attica Lock program? Um, so Walter, I believe he doesn't have any children. He doesn't have any children, he That's writes naked. Wow, thank you for that. I, <laughs> and and that I will never get that out of my head. I actually think, I mean, this sounds so terrible, this sounds so terrible, this sounds so terrible. I actually think I could take Big Walter naked. 
I don't think I could take skinny Walter Nathan. I know it sounds terrible, but... He's gained some of the weight back. Not a lot. Okay, anyway. Uh, he has no children, and I used to do that when I had no kids. Yeah. I used to write every single day. Um, I do write every day, but I, I used to have a, a ritual around it that I can't afford anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm the mother of a six-year-old, and um, I have had to learn that I can't, I can no longer afford to privilege work that happens at a desk between a certain set of hours. Yeah. That if I happen to knock something off while she's in swimming, and, and I'm in the bleachers writing, I have to trust enough that there might be some gem in that. Mm -hmm. And I used to judge that as how could this be good? I mean, I'm, I literally wrote this at gymnastics, or I literally knocked this off, you know, while she's watching the Disney Channel. How could this be good? Um, but I'm learning, and I'm my my new uh, mentor in this area is Susan Strait. Yes, yes, she's my new mentor in this area because she her entire writing career has really kind of involved her kid. I mean, it's. She started publishing writing around the time she became a mother. So she has said many times that she would write in the car at basketball. She, they would be at basketball practice and she would be in the band. Um, as they've gotten older, she says she pretends to go to the grocery store and then doesn't come back for like three hours. And sits in the parking lot with the windows rolled down and a, and a yellow you know, legal pad writing her fiction and yeah. she said when they were little you know I knew I was not going to have the kind of writer's life where you go into your studio and shut the door and say no one bother me because I'm creating she's like I had soccer and yeah. baseball and yeah. PTA and they were always eating and I was always at the grocery store and they were always breaking things so I was always at the doctor and so yeah. you just lug your stuff with you and I sit in the you know front bleacher when they're doing basketball practice and I'm like yeah it's nice nice and she's actually writing and she's no, I, writing my daughter has blended books. My daughter has told me before can you now, <laughs> this sounds terrible, but would you actually watch me? Today, because I mean, sometimes it's swimming. I right, drove you here, didn't I? Yeah, I, I mean, sometimes I don't. I didn't even see the whole swim lesson. Yeah, because I was busy doing something. But here's what right, I. If something went wrong, they call you. They they call me. I'm right there. But um, but here's what I what I do believe in. That I do think that when you start a book, I believe it's a relationship that like um, that needs daily attendance. So if I can't write a page today then let me just write a line. If I can't write a line, let me take a walk and think about something. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the best case scenario is you could sit down and write five pages, 10 pages, whatever, but um, I do think it's like a marriage that you have to, I would no more not, I would no more go three days without talking to my husband than I would go three days without talking to my book mm -hmm. in some kind of way. Mm -hmm. And some of that is because I wanna be in, daily, in a daily relationship, and some of it is just you slow your, when you walk away from it and you have to, you, so let's say I'm like really busy and I just like I'm just not gonna do anything, and then I try and come back and I'm like, no, what was I talking about? Like I waste time trying to catch up. Whereas if I somehow just sit for even five minutes to kind of just feel reconnected or remember the last scene I wrote or or something, it means that when I can get back to it, I don't have to play catch up trying to remember what I was working on because I've tried to hold the energy of it. Mm -hmm. You know, I sometimes even just in the car driving. Uh, the other thing I really am a deep believer, I, I almost cannot write without music. Oh, interesting. I, 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 it is just, it is. So it, what do you play? And do you play you things should, that are appropriate? Like, were you playing, you know, there's like actually, Zydeco when you yeah, were doing this? Yeah. But there's actually a playlist for this on YouTube. My, U, my UK publisher created a playlist on okay. YouTube for the book. And what was on the playlist? Um, there is some um, Liz Wright, okay. um, Jesse May, Hemphill, there's um, the Alabama Shakes, there's um, Otis Redding, there's Lightning Hopkins. Mm -hmm. um, it was a lot of blues. There's some Cassandra Wilson. That's terrific. Uh, Susan Tedeschi. Um, and so I do create playlists. Mm -hmm. um, but what, the reason why I do it is another thing to, A, music for me is just a heart opener. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's Pavlovian for me that I, if I keep playing certain songs while I write, I can turn that song on six months into this process and I will be like That's kind of ju jumping to kind of open in to the point where actually there was a period of time during the cutting season when I was li listening to um, Adele mm -hmm. and my husband turned it on at dinner and I was like, turn that off. That's <laughs> great. Yeah, it made me, it literally made my body go to a heightened kind of place. Yeah. I don't want to be at, at dinner. Yeah. And I was like, please turn that off. So that's the other reason why I use music is that it can kind of provide an emotional shortcut for mm -hmm. me 
to just get back into um, into the groove. And then the only other weird thing I do, and I'm facing it now because I'm finishing a, my third book, I can't read a book where I wrote it. Say that again. <laughs> if, if I wrote the book in my house, I have to then when I sit down to read it, go someplace else. Oh, that's interesting. And because the fear for me is that if I read it where I wrote it, I'll remember what I was trying to do. Mm -hmm. And then I might be filling in that it's actually on the page when it's not really there. And I would rather just go someplace else and see. It's like my brain sees it clean mm -hmm. in a way. And I'll either, you know, commit to um, Casa Del Mar. I don't know why I go to Casa Del Mar. Yeah, it's not even anywhere near my house anymore. Seaside Hotel. It's a gorgeous and, uh, seaside Los hotel Angeles. that has a beautiful lobby. It does. And I would basically park it at Casa And that would be my job for like three days to get through an entire intense reading of it. And I would just go to Casa Del Mar for hours and sit in the lobby. But it was so different from my house mm -hmm. that there'd be no, yes, yeah, it's a lot nicer than my house. That there, was, <laughs> there was no way that I could rem be trying to feel what I was feeling. I don't, I don't know how to explain it, but that's, that is a weird, quirky thing that I do. Do you write from an outline? Some writers do, and some writers just say, I, I just let the characters take me wherever. And, and I'm wondering, I mean, you're a screenwriter too, mm -hmm. so plot you prob is probably very easy for you. It's not easy for me, and I always have to sit down and sort of figure what happens when it happens. I have to do both. I mean, I usually just start, mm -hmm. and then I get about 100 pages in, and I'm like, yeah, I can't kind of go any further because I don't really know what I'm doing. Then um, what do you do? Then I stop and try to plot some stuff out. Mm -hmm. But I never try. I rarely try and hold the whole book until I try and plot out just the end. I also feel like if I knew everything that was going to happen, I kind of would be like, eh, I don't know that you want to write it. I mean, it, I want to be surprised. I want to be um, taken off guard. And um, so I just, you know, I just start and then I realize I can't build on this guy. I have no idea where I'm going. Then I just try and plot a little bit and I write that. Let me see plot like a little bit more mm -hmm. and then that. But I, I rarely try and hold. I have never started a book knowing who did it. I was going to ask you that. So it, it could change as time yes. goes on. Yeah. Because in reading this, I thought I knew who did it, and then I said, nah, it's probably, and then it, it changed a few times, yeah, which I thought to me is a good, but, but no, good I sign about who done it. I don't, I don't know when I, I didn't know when I started, oh, I should be giving some, never mind. It would be giving oh. some away. It would be giving some away. But a lot of this, I can really say, a lot of the stuff with the oil, I didn't know. I was going to be doing that until right. I got closer to it. I knew I wanted to do something. Um, well, I mean, how are you going to do corruption in Texas without dealing with oil? But I was thinking a lot about Enron, mm -hmm. and I was thinking a lot about how that, when that thing imploded, you know, I'm from Texas, it affected so many of my family and friends' lives. Not just people who worked at Enron, but my mom runs a building maintenance company. She cleans, um, she doesn't do it. She, but her company cleans hospitals, universe. Enron was her client. She had to go park her ass there in the building so they can give her a big ass six figure check or she wasn't gonna get paid to write a file. Right. You know, it just all kind of, it just went, the tentacles just went out far. Mm -hmm. But the problem with me writing about something like that is I didn't understand what the hell those people were doing. So I couldn't, I couldn't now tell so the financial really, stuff It was too, really so I needed something physical. And yeah. so I had to do research to find a physical component of corruption around oil. Mm -hmm. It couldn't be as esoteric as those numbers they were moving around. Um, so, I don't know, that was a long, anyway. So no, I don't know anything half the time when I, when I start. But I'm lucky in that I'm not afraid to start over or to be surprised and be like, oh my God, that is a really good idea. That is a lot of work. Mm -hmm. I'm just willing to be like, that's a really good idea. Thank you for the good idea. I'll, I'll, I'll do the work. And it, with my first book, I had to start over because I had this idea that it was going to go between Jay Porter and Charlie mm -hmm. Luckman. Mm -hmm. I thought it was, I wrote a hundred and something pages alternating chapters. And somebody said, that's, I don't think that's your book. Who reads for you? Do you, who do you share it with before it goes out into the wider world? My sister, my husband, and my mom. Okay. I'm not even in that order. Usually it's my husband, which is absolutely useless. It is, it's, it's just a waste of time for both of us. Why? Because there's nothing he can say. If he hates it, he's an asshole. If he loves it, it's just because we're sleeping oh, together. It's it's like, like, can't, <laughs> he, there's, Does the stress make me look Yeah, he can't win. Editorial equivalent. He cannot <laughs> win. And then I also torture him because I don't let him read it peacefully. I'm just kind of like right in the next room. 
Yeah, that so would make me very nervous. It's just, it's absolutely kind of a waste. Um, and then all he just says is, it's good. I mean, really? He can be honest if it's bad. He has said, he said one time, a script I wrote, he was like, I just don't care about any of these people. I was like, God, God, that was tough. But my mom and my sister are really, really good readers. Good. So my mom and my sister are really good. Well, your time is coming up. If you have questions for Attica, we got a couple that were actually emailed to oh. Amistad earlier. So I'm going to do those. And then there's uh, somebody who's being uh, like an, a Harpo producer who's going to come up <laughs> and give you a... Uh, Give you a microphone so you can uh, let I have, I have one here. Attica be Oprah. Yeah, there, there are things up here. You guys want them? There's two. Oh, yeah, do you have two? I don't know. You're going to be rocking the house quite like that. But. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this first one is from uh, Gloria Perry. And she says, I love the smooth way the author intertwines several generations of Karen's African-American family history to show how necessary it is to have a full understanding of oneself in order to solve the problems of the next generation. That's My question for Ms. Locke is, when she chose the name The Cutting Season, does she have other metaphoric connotations in mind concerning our history? If so, can she go into detail? Wow. Um, no, to be honest. <laughs> I was going to reach for one right now, like we're cutting off from our cat. No, no. I meant the fact that that's what they call the harvest. It's called the cutting season. And, you know, people are in the book, so that's really pretty much what I meant. I meant something, a greater metaphor with the fact that it's set in Ascension Parish. Uh -huh. That Ascension meant for me, um, it was about class ascent and, and, and rising yes. up and all that kind of stuff. And, um, and then one reader said to me so kindly that what she read in that was a, because people argue about the ending mm -hmm. a lot, mm -hmm. um, that for her, she liked the ending and that ascension meant um, higher ground, taking the higher ground, taking the higher road mm -hmm. in order to heal and move on. Mm -hmm. And so, but yeah. Okay. This uh, other one comes from Emily de Brigade. Is she here? Are you here, Emily? There she is. Oh, what up? <laughs> and uh, she says, thanks for the cutting season. I really enjoyed it. It's a great read and will make a splendid movie. Do you have a deal <laughs> yet? Who will star? P.S. My husband's family are sugar planters in Latin America, so oh. I can relate to the technical aspects of your book. Wow, wow. They got big ups. Yeah, that's high praise. So, so are we going to turn this into we? <laughs> are you going to turn this into Because, you know, people read this and they, and they say, oh, it's a fabulous book. It's going to be done. And then it goes into the meat grinder that is Hollywood. Yeah. All well, of a sudden, the heroin changes and the relationship with the mother changes. Yeah. And who did it changes. And so, I mean, to be honest, the smartest thing that I could do, I'm just time challenged, mm -hmm. would be to write the script oh, right, myself and start it from there. Um, because when you do it the other way around, um, yeah, you do leave yourself open to all that kind of stuff. There, there was a television producer who wanted it to be a series. He thought it was wow. a television series. And he worked, he's a, uh, Greg Berlanti, he's a big producer, he mm -hmm. won a bunch of Emmys. Mm -hmm. And he was really into it and he worked on a whole breakdown of it. And his deal is at Warner Brothers and he took it to Warner Brothers and they went, oh no, we don't want anything to do with slavery. <laughs> And we just don't want to have anything to do. And I don't think that either Greg didn't do a good enough job pitching, which I kind of doubt. But the book, I think people think like it's like roots or something. Like it's it's a it's a contemporary look on how we think about slavery. But it's feel not a good story about it. <laughs> <laughs> what was that the Fox thing, the hit secret life of did Dexter Filkins or something? Something that like that. Shine yeah. Bride played and it was about I remember a that and it was slave UPN, butler it was to because it was a big Abraham in the, it was in a the big Lincoln White House and it, it was a pilot and it never went anywhere because everybody wrote letters and they yeah, were it was a big Fox just said we're just they said the same thing Warner Brothers did we're not dealing with slavery, we're yeah. just yeah. Yeah. But then I mean you know but then you've got twelve years of slave yes. coming out. Yes. And and that means and then people loved Quentin Tar I mean, I didn't see um, oh, Django. <laughs> Django. That's not, it's not funny. But I also can't stand Quentin Tarantino. I mean, I just find him insufferable. 
So I'm not a big Quentin Tarantino fan, but I had a, at the time like a 20 year old who kept saying, you gotta go see it. He saw it four times. Oh my and so God. I went to I would to rather get four root canals in the <laughs> I'll tell you, the, the end was just amazing. I was just like, I, oof. Um, because it was just like 20 minutes of gratuitous, unrelenting here's, bloodshed. Here's my problem with him. First of all, I cannot stand his, his um, thinking that because you revere black culture, you're getting a pass. And you oh, can no. be irresponsible. Um, That's not why he gets the pass. Why? He gets the pass because he's NBA. He's Negro by association because his mother's long-term boyfriend is black. That's the tiredest story I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> I just hate stuff like that. But what really pisses me off about Jane Bunch, so with any kind of art, you're always kind of asking why now? Yeah. Why, why, why are you doing this now? And what, Jenga, was it right before the election or right after? So you got all these people already hyped up wanting to want. It's like Christmas, I think. So you got all these people hyped up on Obama. And all this kind of, here's the problem with Jane and Chain, where you're doing this thing about uh, a slave revolt and black people taking just, this is white people's worst fear in corners of the country that your ass, Quentin, is not going to be trying to go to the fucking grocery store in. So don't start up stuff that you don't have to deal with. That really angers me because you're going to be sitting in Beverly Hills and when I'm, you know, in Louisiana, I'm the one who has to deal with the cracker that's afraid that I'm going to pull out a gun. He doesn't have to deal with that. His mouth is writing the check that you're going to have that's to That's right. His <laughs> mouth is writing the check that my ass has to, that's right, that's it, that yeah. my ass has to cap. Yeah. He drives me crazy. Can we think so. he's just a little disturbed about this? <laughs> Anybody else have a question that's sorry. not about Quentin sorry, Tarantino? Sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, Mr. Yes, sorry. Shorter. Um, I, I don't think I need a, uh, a okay. uh, simple question. Uh, writing mysteries is a specialized genre. How did you get involved? Did this happen when you were young? Were you fascinated with mysteries? How did you fall into this particular genre? Um, first of all, I, I, I am ambivalent about being called a mystery writer. Um, sometimes I don't like it. Sometimes Why I do like, like it. it? For Walter mostly doesn't either. He for says, I'm fear that people won't take me serious. That's really just the bottom line. That 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 if you say mystery novelist and somebody else who might have liked this book says, "But I don't read mysteries," then you feel like they're just not going to pick it up. But that's because they don't know what mysteries are. Jane Eyre is a mystery, right? That's, 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 that's when I am fine with it because I I think that every novel is a mystery. You start, you tease out information over the course of the thing. Mm -hmm. So that's how I feel about it. I do worry about. Um, the category of it, but to really deeply answer your question, I just, I guess, am drawn to, I watch Dateline, I watch 2020, I watch every dead woman in a ditch, you know, show that ever comes on. I think there's a part of me as a woman that's slightly fascinated with pl playing out these cautionary tales. and trying to think like how would I handle like a situation or, or could I spot the, the bad person in the room. Um, when I was in college, and this is a very long story that, that is really good, and you should all buy me drinks and I'll tell it to you. <laughs> uh, I lived with a compulsive liar uh, in college, my um, sophomore and junior year, who created a stalker that didn't exist, Whoa. that she said was uh, at coming after her. And she had an elaborate, elaborate, elaborate story around it. She was sending correspondence to herself from this person. I mean, it escalated up to the point where she was cutting herself, saying that this person had attacked her. Wow. It was insane Lifetime movie. It was crazy. But somewhere in that for me is this fascination with what I did see and what I didn't see. And I guess I'm just kind of fascinated by like liars and criminals and like why they think they can pull it off, why sometimes they do pull it off, and can I figure out who the hell these people are so I can be protected in a way. Um, there's a book I read that I just loved called, of all things, The Sociopath Next Door. Oh yeah. And her yeah. point was that it's a spectrum and that on the empathy side you have Gandhi and Dr. King and over here you have Dahmer. And the rest of us are all in the middle. And you, you are walking around sociopaths all the time. They're just not all. Some of them are just some shady coworkers. Yeah. Some of them are just, are just some neighbors yeah. that'll run over your dog and don't care. Mm -hmm. And it's very important to figure out who they are and to get away from them. And so I guess I'm kind of sitting in 
darkness in order to, I don't know, get around it? I don't know. But I'm just really, really fascinated by criminals and liars and why, um, why they think they're going to get away with it and then why sometimes they do. I mean, I watch every minute of that Jody Arias trial. Oh. Gavel to gavel people. My sister was like, is that really going on? Are they really playing the sex tape in court? I said, I can recite it verbatim. <laughs> yes, they are. They and I watched are. every bit of it. I watched every bit of the George Zimmerman trial. I guess I'm, and I'm, I'm, the, I'm the daughter of a lawyer and the wife of a lawyer. So then I'm also kind of fascinated by, um, I guess, crime. And the guess. law. And yeah. crime and law. I'm, I'm just really, I also think that, you know, Dennis Lehane, who, by the way, you know, is this book was the first that he chose for his new imprint. I adore him. I, he really walks his talk. He really is into supporting other um, authors. I love that the two people he picked for his imprint are both women. Um, I, I just adore him. And he talks about the crime novel being the social novel of our time. Mm -hmm. And I do believe that on the ground is where you can play out policy that's made up here. That, you know, we were talking in class today about The Wire. You know, that here's a great show that is so full of information about drug policy and about poverty and about how, how systems work to create it, but they don't do it up from up here. They just get you down on the ground and let you see it play out. And you actually learn more about how drug policies screw stuff up. Or how, so I'm, I, I do think that, at least for me, writing stories around a crime puts me down on the ground in a way that keeps me from ha you know, getting caught up in all my lofty ideas. Um, I was joking earlier say that if you leave a body on page three, it's not a lot of big speeches you can make because you left a body on page three that has to be kind of, um, kind of addressed. But I'm, I'm, you know, even last night we got to the hotel, I was right away like, now where's it safe to walk? I'm, maybe she I'm did. just fucking paranoid. Maybe I'm really a paranoid. Living in LA will do that too. Maybe <laughs> living in LA will do that to you. But I'm just, I do have a feeling that there are good people and there are bad people out there. And it is imperative that I know which is which. We probably help. Is there a question over here? Good evening. Is this one? Mm -hmm. um, I'm in two book clubs. I read both your books. Um, I appreciate your writing, and I like in the cutting season the multiracial um, stories that were told mm -hmm. because we are a more multiracial society. Um, I appreciate your comment about plantations. Uh, I remember being in New Orleans with my husband, and we had an opportunity to take tours. Mm -hmm. And of course, there's one tour that takes you to all the plantations. Mm -hmm. No, we're not taking that. <laughs> Um, but in Connecticut, there is a facility that's called the plantation, and I was no words can say what I how I felt. But I remember an organization was having their Christmas party there, and uh -huh, invited yeah. me to join. And I did not join because they thought the plantation was a great place to have a Christmas party. Mm -hmm. I, I just couldn't. I can't. I feel the yeah, same way yeah. you do. That there's things that I'm about plantation, well, I can watch a movie and read about slavery. I can't go and have a party. Yeah, exactly, and exactly. What's going on. Um, my question is, what's the name of your next book, if it's, if it's titled yet? Because I'm ready. <laughs> I can't tell you the name, do you but I can tell you a little bit. It's been it's called? been different. Um, with the first book, it was not called Black White Rising. That didn't come till the very end. Oh really? When my editor and my agent were like, "You're terrible at picking titles. Let us do it." Um, and then uh, the cutting season, it just kind of came mm -hmm. in the process. But I knew the title of the next book because it's a location. Mm -hmm. But it picks up Jay Porter again some years later. Okay. So he's coming back and, and it deals with an election. When can we look for it? It's, I'm just turning it in, so it's not going to come out until next year. Okay. I'm, I'm turning it in in November. All right, book club members. Yeah, get on it. Let's get on it. Can, can I just identify all the people in Soul Passage? Yes. I I, look at me. I'm just telling people what to do. Hello. Yay. We love Thank book clubs. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Um, we just finished reading a book called 47 by Walter Mosley. Mm -hmm. And it's a mem it's it's uh, a young adult book, and he wrote it because he it's a memoir of 47, who is a slave. Mm -hmm. 
And he wanted, he, I think he wrote it because he felt that we needed to deal with slavery in this country. We needed to know what it was about. It was terrible, it was horrible, but we need to get over it and we need to be able to talk about it and not sweep it under the rug. And so, and I'm getting, and not just you, but um, the producer, whoever wanted to do mm -hmm. your, you know, uh, a lot of people are afraid to talk about it. Now, Walter Mosley felt that uh, science fiction and spirituality kind of uh, gave us some kind of equity or, or was able to equalize it or make it seem like it's something we can get over uh, or make it appear uh, palatable so we can deal with mm -hmm, it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I just wondered how you felt about that because you seem to be ambivalent, as many other people are, about talking about slavery. Uh, it's something that happened in this country and it needs to be recognized as something that happened in this country. Right. It would be not to run away from it. We were talking about this today that there's not, you know, we did not have Nuremberg trials or a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. There was no um, countrywide gathering to acknowledge. I mean, Clinton kind of said something off the cuff. I mean, that's pretty much what we have for an apology. Right. Um, my opinion is that. I agree that you cannot get past anything that's in shadow, so you have to talk it out. I don't understand why, t why people believe that talking about it diminishes. Um, to me, America is a, a great freedom experiment that has to keep checking its results. So we need to keep checking in constantly on ourselves. And I don't think talking about when we were not um, when we were not coming down right in, in our you know freedom experiment diminishes where we are. If anything, it can strengthen us to kind of talk about that time period. I mean, what I hope for these um, these oak alleys of the world, these these historical plantations, my hope for them is that they recognize that they have an opportunity to serve a, um, a historical purpose, a psychological and emotional purpose. Which is when you go to a lot of these places, you know, they take you on a tour of the main house and they talk about the china and the curtains and all this kind. And they may have the cabins still in the back. When I first went to O'Galley, they didn't have any cabins. They had taken them all down, and all they had was a plaque with the name of the slaves and what they cost, and that was it. And what I think they're missing is that some people. I, I met a group of black women in, in, in at Tulane who were in a book club who said they were all gonna go to Oak Alley that Saturday and what should they expect? And I told them, I, I didn't know what you were gonna find, but you know, tell me, write me back. And they sent me photos, they took their children, they said it was one of the most moving experiences for them. And I think that some of these historical sites misunderstand, it's okay for people to come here and lay hands on it and cry. And let them do it and leave them alone and don't shove a pamphlet in their face. Just let people have a minute to sit with it and touch it and make peace with it. Because I actually, in the course of this experience, felt like I kind of made peace. And that I'm, that I can, now mind you, Obama was in the White House, now Bush was in there. That, that might have been a different experience on the plantation that day. But there was a sense of, you know, we, America, when it gets some stuff right, it can get some stuff really right. And so it only made me feel invigorated that if we've done the breadth of this, then let's come on with the people because we could do a lot more. We can do a lot more. And so I don't think there's a pro you know, problem holding that. And I do wish more people would. Um, what I don't think we're going to see, and we were talking about this today, is I don't think we're going to have like a slavery week where I don't know everybody. I don't know that we can have a moment anymore to gather around. And I was saying Americans, I think, would get so, it would just be Fox News and The Daily Show arguing with each other. And you would miss that it was slavery week for talking about whether or not we need to have a slavery week. So I don't think we're going to be able to pull that off. But I do think some of these physical spaces would do well to leave a little elbow room for to people to have a wailing wall experience. And you know, it doesn't always have to be about the child. I mean, some people can go on that tour. But some people can also just have feelings. And, and if we have feelings, I'm not telling you, white tour guide, that you are a cracker slave master. I'm just having my feelings. And you don't have to be um, threatened by that that you know, I have my legacy, you have yours, but I think that people get really uncomfortable that I'm somehow saying, and if I'm having feelings about slavery, that you're responsible, you in this moment right now. 
All I give a shit about is what the Supreme Court did last month. I don't really, you know, that's, I'm willing to hold people to that, but I'm not holding individual white people to task about slavery in 2013. Only Scalia and his sorry, and his sorry butt. But um, anyway, so I do think people should talk about it more, I agree. And, and beyond that, uh, we need to educate our youth, because they don't, they don't teach about, they don't teach certain parts of history in school, at least they didn't in my high school. They started history of the 19th century. And so um, that's a problem. When I think a book like 47, just like you read about Steinbeck, mm -hmm. the Bridge of Wrath, and, and the Bridge of Terabithia, and, and, and I, I think, Night by mm -hmm. Edward so we could read something that puts slavery well, in respect. Well, I think for young people, what they potentially need to hear, because, what, and I think Donovan represents in my book, he's a character who they have this. They do slavery enactments in, in the book. And I wrote this because there was an article in the LA Times years ago about one of these Georgia plantations. And they were doing slave life plays. And some of the young people, who are just people who live in the area, and it's just like a job, right. were like, I'm not saying all this mess of this and mess of that. And I want the script rewritten, or we're going on strike. And I thought the idea of slaves going on strike was hilarious. <laughs> and so the, the Donovan comes from you know, this young people who, well, back in the day, if I was a slave, I wouldn't have done da 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 People want to, you know. But I think if you frame it for people, because I remember feeling shame in school when it came up, and the images side by side of what white people had done in the country. Because they make us, you know, it, your brain as a six, seven, eight, nine, ten year old says that all white people were landowners, not true, and all of them had power, not true, and all of us were in tatters. Yes, and, and all of us were in tattered clothes and just kind of beat down. You can hear the harmonica in the background, you know. But I think to teach young people about survivorship and about, um, you know what I mean? Like, instead of it being like, I don't know how to put it. And I guess there's been a period where we, I'm not trying to talk about, because it's so, we, people Uncle Tom you and say, I'm not talking about pride about being a slaver. I'm talking about pride about surviving that shit. Yeah, right. Surviving it. Instead of teaching it that it was this, you, you were having this beat down experience and you were nothing. No, we are something because, I mean, we're all kind of still walking around. You know, we weren't obliterated as a race of people. And I think if it can be framed, half of it is about how you frame stuff for, um, for young kids. My, my daughter is six, and she, for, that's what it, that, the, the, the question she, her, a friend of hers at school told her that she shouldn't call herself brown skin. And, and I said, well, it's, no, you know, you need to have a talk with your friend about this, because if you guys are gonna be buddies for a minute, you need to be able to communicate to her that I, that's what I call myself, and that's what I'm comfortable with. My daughter marched up to her friend, did it, and she said, Mommy, she still told me I shouldn't call myself that. She said brown skinned people used to drink out of toilets. Oh, so we, we have work to do, but it right? will all be finished tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank you for, uh, for the conversation and thank you all for your, uh, for your questions, for your interest, and, um, and thanks. Thank you guys. Thank you.